Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to In Violence, a podcast where we explore how faith and health, both physical and mental, intertwine in our daily lives and how we can finally find balance as Muslims. It feels so good to be back. I hope you guys are doing well, inshallah. Honestly, I didn't think that not posting for a week would be weird but last friday subhanallah i just it, it didn't sit right <laughs> i was like uh, i know that i'm not doing something even if i told you guys that i wasn't going to post but anyway we're back on track we're ready to start this new year i hope you guys are enjoying the beginning of 2024 um we know that this is an, an islamic new year and personally the first of january isn't even the um, most important date of the year for me. I do prefer the 1st of September, the first day of Ramadan. But, you know, it's um, I feel like it's always a good opportunity for us to reset, to check our intentions, to set new goals. So I hope you guys have been doing all of this. And if you haven't already, just know that it's okay if you haven't done that on the 1st of January, you still have the whole week or even the whole month if you want to. So don't overpressure yourself with everything that we see on social media. Speaking of social media, today's episode is, um, I was going to say is a special one. And you guys are going to say, Asya, you say that about all the episodes. <laughs> and you would be right to say that. The reason why I'm saying that it is special is because it wasn't planned. And I thought, you know what, um, I want to change my plans slightly and I want to be flexible and I want to create content and do an episode that is going to be useful at this specific time. And right now I am talking to you guys. Uh, I'm posting the podcast tomorrow and um, today is day 90 of the disaster that has been going on in, in Gaza and I've been thinking about ways that I can keep using my platforms and my content to help Palestinians, but I also wanted to bring something to you guys to deal with the situation a little bit better. Because let's be honest, it's been heavy for all of us when it comes to our mental health and even sometimes in terms of physical health. And a few weeks ago, I came across a concept that I hadn't heard of before that is called collective trauma. So I decided to do a little bit more research and I realized that we were currently all experiencing a collective trauma regarding what is going on in Palestine. So I thought I need to I need to address that. I need to bring some comfort, some help to people who might be struggling with this more than others. So in this episode, I am joined by Halima and Emira, who are the founders of Emeli. Emeli provides mental health services and psychoeducation through different things such as workshops, healing circles, individual and group sessions. And their goal is truly to challenge the stigma surrounding mental health in the Muslim community, but also in multicultural communities. In this episode, we discuss the definition of collective trauma, especially regarding what is going on in Palestine. We describe how it manifests itself both in your mental and physical health. We also talk about the part that faith plays both for Palestinians and us witnessing this genocide. And finally, Halima and Amira share pieces of advice on how to deal with personal and collective trauma. I truly hope that you will find this conversation as insightful as I did and that it will make you realize how how important it is to take care of yourself and take care of your health during these difficult times. I know how sometimes it doesn't feel fair, but remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just and that he promised us that the believers will be victorious. And that means that Palestine will be free. Okay, there we go. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I hope you're doing well, inshallah. Welcome to a new episode of In Balance. Um, today is is an episode that wasn't planned, but I thought it was very important. And 
the guests that I have today, I had planned from the beginning. And I'm so grateful that I accepted to change the topics that we're going to talk about today um, because I trust their expertise so much. But I'm going to let them introduce themselves and what they do, inshallah. So, salam alaikum, Halima, and salam alaikum, Amira. How are you guys doing? Alaikum salam. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for having us on. Uh, it's honestly my pleasure. I, For you guys, to give you a little bit of context, Halima and Amira are the founders of Amali Mindset. And I came across, I, I find you guys on Instagram. And when I found your account, I was so blown away by the amount of amazing work you've been doing and how much, how needed it was for our community. So it only made sense to have you on the podcast because as everyone here knows, the goal of the podcast is to highlight health and faith in general and the link it has, like they have together. So I'll let you guys introduce Amali and what is your mission with it? Jazakallah for for reaching out and uh, finding us on Instagram. <laughs> we kind of started um, on Instagram in 2020 um, during COVID, actually. So Halima and I, this is kind of our little origin story. Uh, we met uh, right when we graduated from undergrad and then individually decided to go on to do our master's in counseling and so in psychology. Um, and then also individually we're thinking wow it would be so amazing if we did that and came back to our community to bring back what we can because it really just didn't exist at least in our um, city in San Diego like we didn't know of any Muslim therapists at the time and so we did that we each went to individual schools um, and then came back and subhanallah we wanted to start it after we graduated, but COVID hit like a few months before we did. And so we actually were able to launch virtually during Ramadan, um, where we actually just did Instagram. We didn't even provide therapy yet. We were just putting out there um, psychoeducation and basically uh, information on mental health during Ramadan and things that we can do to help. Um, and so our mission really is to bring expertise from the Western type of therapy and mold it for Muslims and make it make it make sense. Um, there's a lot of things from Islam that um, we can really pull that connect and parallel with a lot of our Western teachings. And then things that they don't teach that we just know that is there in Islam that we can use for our community. That's our biggest goal is to really find that integration um, and to provide a space for Muslims of really different backgrounds to feel comfortable with therapy and put, feel comfortable with like alternative forms of healing. Um, so that's why we do things like healing circles because it really is community-based. We do support groups during Ramadan for really specific um, things. So for example, people that are diagnosed with eating disorders that either can't fast or have a really hard time fasting during Ramadan or addictions to um, anything really and kind of giving them a space to be able to do that. So. While we do provide therapy, we also provide these types of spaces as well. This is absolutely amazing. And I think one of the things that I first came across was one of your healing circles for Ramadan. And I thought that was such a wonderful initiative because indeed we just don't see that a lot. And I was talking about this with a friend of mine who is a therapist here in France. And she was saying that Muslims really do need Muslim therapists because, as you said, psychology in general is just way too influenced by Western standards. And there are things that Islam teaches us that just simply don't align with um, with the Western way of seeing things. So I am so glad and happy to see women like you two doing great things like this and helping people to reconnect with their mental health because I also feel like so many people think that having mental health issues is simply a lack of faith and that isn't fair to say. Uh, that is such a dangerous thought right to put into our community that it really is a, a lack of faith and I, I do want to touch on and I'll let Halima speak to this too but the healing circles that we do we actually pulled from the uh, Black Psychology Association so it is something that a different group has done before and it was very effective for that collective sort of mindset and I'll let Halima speak a little bit more about how we got into doing that I'm um, just to make sure we give credit due where it's due 
as Amira mentioned, the association Black Psychology, um, you know, are the ones who, um, you know, created the healing circles or introduced it to us as well. But um, in my mentors and supervisors, when I was in grad school, I was doing my master's in multicultural counseling and social justice education. So one of the things that we focused on is community-based um, interventions, right? And healing circles is a way that communities come together and really just share how they're feeling and specifically people who are connecting on the same thing, um, especially when we're feeling helpless. Because a lot of times there are things we can't we can't fix, right, at that moment. But what we can do is help each other by coming together, right? And that's what healing circles are for, for a lot of us. I love how you describe this. And this is something I, I didn't know existed before I came across your page. And it's so good that you're giving credit where it's due. Uh, I wish we had more of this here. But I'm also happy to see that this crosses perfectly with today's topic, which is all about Palestine collective trauma. And I was made aware of the existence of a collective trauma through my friend that I just mentioned. And when I talked about the topic on stories, I got a few questions saying, I didn't know this existed. Uh, can PTSD be a collective a collective a collective, I can speak, <laughs> a collective thing as well. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like a lot of people are actually unaware of this. Could you guys tell us a little bit about what collective trauma is and how, like in what ways it manifests, manifests itself? Yeah. So, you know, yes, um, people can experience collective trauma, right? PTSD. Um, You know, we also, I, I want to, so collective trauma, I want to give examples of what, what is, how did it look like? And there is one that we recently have experienced all together, which is COVID, right? COVID is one of the things that we experienced as collective trauma. All of us were scared, anxious. We didn't know, you know, especially when we, one thing is we look at is like our fear of something that we do not have control over, right? And that was one thing we all experienced. Um, isolating and change. Um, so that all happened. And same thing when we're looking at, um, you know, what's going on right now, right? Is we don't feel like we have control. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know when things are going to end, right? So that's an example of how collective trauma looks like for us. And thinking about right now, you know, I'm, not, I'm using COVID for a reason because right now, even till this day, we still have people who are still struggling from the after effects of COVID. And we're still experiencing it right now, right? A lot of people have developed uh, anxiety. And if they had anxiety before, they're more anxious than before. Same with people who have experienced and watching things going full of steam is that they would get anxious already, worry about their family, but now with everything going on and ongoing, then they're even more anxious and more depressed, right? So it's ongoing. So another thing is PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder versus complex, We what's going on when it's ongoing, even COVID, right? It's still ongoing, right? They would call that complex trauma. So I just want to emphasize kind of the differences because what Palestinians are going through right now is not PTSD, it's complex trauma, meaning it's ongoing. Um, so just understanding that and it is collective trauma, right, that they're all experiencing and, and things and how it manifests, including like the symptoms is panic attacks, um, trouble falling asleep, uh, anxiety, uh, which is rooted in f f is rooted from fear. Right. Um, having a hard time falling asleep. I don't know if I already mentioned that. And uh, flashbacks. A big one is hypervigilance. Um, and nightmares. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of people having nightmares. And I think that's also connected to watching uh, photos and videos, um, which is vicarious trauma is when you're watching something and you're, you end up um, taking on, you know, the, as if you're experiencing it yourself. Um, and let's see, what else am I missing? Um, and I mean, you want to add anything on the physical? how it manifests physically? Yeah, the other thing I see with people that are experiencing like, like, trauma either collectively or after effects is like digestion issues stomach issues headaches things like almost like your body is physically holding on to these traumatic things and you haven't helped it or your body hasn't been able to let it go and so it manifests itself and stuff like that which is super interesting and, and really can affect your immune system too so that's why it's really important to actually understand trauma how it affects your body that there are different types of it and that it can have long-term effects on your body if you're if you're just completely ignoring it for years on end and it, it makes people sick um and 
I mean, I love that you're really like piecing out the different types of trauma. I think the West has a very rigid idea of post-traumatic stress disorder and diagnosing it, that it has to be post. It has to be a very specific traumatic event. Your system, your symptoms have to be, you know, attached to that specific trauma. But that's not exactly how we work. And that's not exactly how collective society works either. Like we feel for each other. And a lot of times we experience things together. And the complex trauma is so important to really think about because and we heard this from actually a psychologist that works in the West Bank and has obviously gone to Gaza as well. They don't treat trauma in Palestine, right? Because it's ongoing. It's their life. It truly is. And the occupation has been there for over 70 years and people are born into it and live it their whole life. So they're never really treating trauma because there's no post. It's just like life. And so they're treating coping they're treating anxiety, they're treating how someone with autism can experience what they're experiencing in in their world and how they can sort of like cope with it and adjust to it. Uh, They're treating anxiety, they're treating physical symptoms. So, um, you know, I I really love that we're piecing out all the different types of trauma. And if we're talking about folks that are not in Palestine, you know, what we're experiencing is watching a genocide happen. And that's not an easy thing for all of us to experience together. And that will manifest in your body if, you know, you're not really dealing with it. Like you could be having trouble sleeping like Halima sleep, you know, is talking about and you're not sure what to do with that. And that affects other parts of your body. You're not recovering well. You're getting sick more often. You're not having an appetite. There's so many different things that you could be experiencing with it. I just want to add one more thing with also like for I see this a lot especially with the Palestinians who are living in the west right now but they come from families who are pushed out of Palestine or that had to lose that lost their homes um and thinking about what they have to experience right losing their homes having to uh, go to a place that they've never been and having to whatever it is learning a different language and all that trauma that are your parents or grandparents had to experience and how that you know passed on into your blood right because we believe in transgenerational trauma meaning that we inherit you know, the trauma of our parents and our grandparents, if they there hasn't been a, a way of, if it hasn't healed, right? So a lot of the people who are in the West, Palestinians, and they're like, yeah, I, I'm feeling highly impacted by this. It's crippling me. You're wondering is also which part of that is also your parents and your grandparents trauma that you're holding on in your body as well. So just want to also add that part in there. Yeah, this is something that I feel like is very important to mention. Um, I have seen even yesterday, uh, Subhi Taha, he was sharing um, how his parents left everything, just like their house was still with all their souvenirs and their memories, and they just left like this and and flee to the U.S. And I, when I was listening listening to his story, I thought this must have been so hard to just leave everything you built and your home and to go to a country that not only is not yours but also is completely different like on the end of the spectrum in terms of beliefs in terms of what you're used to and when we think about what palestinians are going through i feel like it's very easy to limit it to what is going is currently going on in gaza and and like being exposed to so much violence and atrocities but it goes way beyond that and um one thing that i've i've been finding hard is that and, and and I think that's something that we will talk about in the episode is that indeed your body is going to have, might have certain responses. And I met people who willingly were depriving themselves from certain things. Like, it's not fair that I get to eat when they don't have food. It's not fair that I get to live my life when they are under bombs and everything. Do you feel like this is something um, that is can be reinforced when you yourself have your own traumas and then this hits harder or like what is going to be the difference between how one person is dealing with this Mm -hmm. from another isn't that such an interesting concept that we, we talk about like environment versus like genetics like what you're born with and how you sort of grow up and really like the more and more we delve into it it's it's all of it. <laughs> Each person is going to react differently. And, and what you're talking about, like that transgenerational drama, there is evidence for it. Like it seems like a magical sort of concept, but it's called epigenetics, right? And it truly means that there is mutations to your genes while you're living, right? The way your body's reacting to things and you pass it on 
to your children. And so what's really important, and, and it this kind of ties into the concept of like how you react, you're not sure how you might react, right? It's accepting that that's how your body is reacting. And what are you going to do with it? Because are you going to want to pass that on to your children genetically? Like, are we thinking about our future generations as well? And really wanting to change sort of how we react to those things in a, in a healthier way so you can pass that on. Um, I think this is such an interesting concept. And the, the true answer is like, you never know how you're going to react, right? Like even us, like all of our clients are also different. It's really hard to be like, oh, this is where it's from. This is like why you react. We all react this way. It's never uniform. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also looking at how our parents are coping with it now or how they coped with it before, right? Because we learn our coping skills from our parents growing up. We see, you know, what did they do when they were feeling sad? What were they doing when they're angry? And what did they do when they felt helpless? I think that's the biggest one. When they felt helpless, what, are they, what were they doing? Because a lot of times we will feel helpless as part of, you know, life. And is that what do we do and how do we cope with it, right? So I think that's another thing is what's passed on to us is the way our families cope and looking at that. And that's why you'll notice people cope differently too, because that's a big one is people do cope differently and some people haven't coped with it. And if your family hasn't coped with it at all or haven't been doing anything to cope with it, then you'll notice that it's even harder for you. That that for me is so interesting because I started getting interested in mental health a few years ago, but this transgenerational trauma and how you like trauma can be passed down from a generation to another and can and you can experience it without realizing that you just got it from your basically your ancestors is something that when I learned about it, it blew my mind. And that conversation came from like that, that thought came from a conversation with my sister when she was reading a study saying that um, a lot of Algerian people, because Algeria went through a similar history than what Palestine is going through. And we are Algerian. And she was saying so many Algerian have a lot of anxiety problem, a lot of anger control problems and it's it's like they're known mm -hmm. for it but no one is thinking about it and now that this study came out and highlighted the importance of knowing transgenerational trauma and everything it just it opened my eyes and I was so I thought subhanallah really like the importance of once again really dive into I'm not saying it's easy obviously to face whatever you were traumatized by or you're anxious by or fear but the importance of really trying to face it with the right people and how we can unfold so many things you didn't know subhanallah yeah and i want to i want to add one thing is like an example of this is the people of gaza right people keep asking why are they how do they cope like this right why is their iman so strong that's because they had to cope this way their whole life right and um their also acceptance of death and the way they perceive death too, right? That's something that they grew up watching, right? Like, this is how we see death. This is how we see life. This is our Iman. This is our relationship with Allah. So that's a big one too, is to look at how, like how their, the transgenerational has passed on, right? And that, that way as well. And I love that you mentioned that because that was one of my questions. I was, when I was thinking about this chat with you guys, I thought, are there specific things that Muslim people, women i'm talking about muslim women because that's the podcast is dedicated to muslim women but i should say muslims in general is there something that is different about them when facing collective trauma and i think what you just said is so interesting because for me i i always thought they are such a great example of faith and and like whenever you see people like uh, people in in Gaza, like being asked how are you feeling they always say alhamdulillah that's the first thing they say it's like it's almost automatic that's the like the first thing they think about and i remember like reading a comment saying i am so impressed by how they've been dealing with all of this and someone said what you just said that's literally all they have but not in the sense that they don't have anything else in their life but more so that's how they've been dealing with all of this and It's at, in one way that is incredibly touching, but I feel like that also sets the difference between them and how they've been dealing with the situation and us who also are Muslims yet tend to 
when we try to deal with what is going on, the response is very different. You know, some people, they're like, I have tawakkul, I trust Allah. I know he is the most just and he is going to punish those oppressors. But then you have, you see people that question Allah and they're like, why, why is he not doing anything about this when the world has failed to help Palestinians? Have you faced, like, have you had clients like this? And what has been your response to that? Yeah, um, so definitely we get that a lot, actually, right? And um, people kind of questioning, you know, why is this happening? And I think people have been questioning all, every time that there's an event like this, like genocide, right? Like, why, why did Allah allow genocide? And why, you know, questioning all that things. And it goes back to, again, I, and I keep bringing back the people of Gaza, right? And people have been comparing, why are they coping like this and we're coping like that? And it's also thinking about, like, I think the people of Gaza also understand the wisdom of what's going on. They understand, they, they see things in a very much justice-oriented way. And I think that's how, even if you give, um, if you're supporting people in Gaza, it's always about justice. Their focus is on justice, right? And the belief that justice will happen. And I think, you know, um, as Muslims, we believe in afterlife. We believe in Jannah, right? We also believe that this is a, uh, the life is temporary. We believe that life is a test. And we believe that we will be going through trials, right? But also other the other part, right? Um, the wisdom also is thinking about the amount of Muslim, uh, I'm sorry, the amount of people who have um, converted to Islam, right? Because of what's going on. And the... Um, and people recognizing the power that they have, how our money impacts these things, how um, I think like, for example, with the boycotting that's been going on, right? People are like, wow, we were able to destroy companies when we would have never thought that, right? And I think it's a reminder from Allah is the power we have as people, the power we have as Muslims. And I think we're so focused on like, yes, there's death, but death is part of life, right? But what does Allah want us to take from this, right? And also the people who stayed silent, because this has been going on for years, right? Um, so just uh, one of the things that uh, I usually really reference is what is also coming out of this? We think about what we're losing, right? But what are we losing? And what, is Allah, what has Allah promised us, right? And, and, and I want to emphasize, like, this has really pushed Muslims in the West to do more, right? And to recognize their power. I think that one too. Really for like Muslim clients, it's what have we learned in Islam? Like what in the Quran, there's so many stories of trials and tribulations and such difficult things that the messengers, the prophets and people have gone through. And every single time there is a lesson from it. There's something gained from it. There's something that we couldn't even imagine would come from it. And so that's what I get reminded of. Right. And, you know, the, the Quran like talks about Palestine, right? It talks about it's going to be free one day, right? And so I think that's what keeps a lot of people in Palestine going. It's what keeps a lot of us going is that, you know, we we have to be resilient through that. And this, this is something that we know is going to be free at one point. Um, and so that's what I think of. And the other thing I think of is um, a hadith. And I'm trying to remember the exact one, but the one that talks about like, if it is the day of judgment happening in front of you, and you are planting something, you finish planting it, right? You finish going all the way through it. And that reminds me of the next question I get from a lot of people is like, why is Allah doing this? And how can I like keep living my life if this is happening? That's how, that's exactly what Allah is telling you, that you need to continue doing a lot of those things because that is your purpose, right? Maybe the people that are living there, their purpose is something different and your purpose is something different. And you need to find that while you're planting that tree and trying to like um, pave that way and figure that out for yourself. A few years ago, I, I think it was when the, 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 there's, there had been attacks in Shajara and I, Palestine had always very, very special place in my heart. And I used to get so crazy mad and angry anytime I would hear what was going on because, and I wasn't questioning Allah, but it was more so like being angry at people basically and at the word for letting that happen. And back then, I think my faith wasn't as strong as it is now, but it's not what it is about. It's more so that I didn't really read and learn as much as I should have back then 
Because the more you read and study and deeply connect with the words of Allah, the more you realize that if he makes certain people go through so much, it's because he loves them deeply. And it's sometimes it's a concept that is hard to grasp because we're only human and we're so influenced by this dunya. That's how we were created. But when you read the Quran, when you study you study the, the Islamic literature, you realize that if prophets who were messenger messengers and chosen by Allah, they knew that they were going to Jannah, yet they had to go through situations that we would never bear. Like sometimes I think about certain thing, things and I'm like, I don't know if uh, how I he went through this. And I'm thinking that Allah must love Palestinians so, so much for like them to go through this, yet still say Alhamdulillah in like through everything. And one thing that I said on the account is that first of all, Palestine holds a deep, like a very important place in in our religion. So many prophets were born there. It's just, you know, it's a sacred a sacred place. It's it just has this deep meaning for us. So I understand how frustrating it is for people and and why collective trauma around Palestine exists because it has that deep importance for us. But also I feel like that's a beautiful lesson for us to take a step back and be like how like how amazing and and grateful we should be to be Muslim because if they are going through this then so many of them are going to Jannah. And they serve as an example for us, just like the prophets were, for us to then, as you said, Amira, to do our job, you know, to keep working for the right things. Yeah. And while it's not okay what's happening, right? Like, it shouldn't be happening. We we shouldn't be watching. And yeah, and while it might feel natural, like, have that thought of, like, why is this happening? Like, why is all of this happening? Like, I don't want you to judge yourself for having that thought, right? It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. You have that thought, but what really matters is what you do with it, which is exactly what you're talking about, Asya, which is putting it into context of the world. And then and then my reaction was like, it, I feel like it snapped me back to reality watching how severe it got in Gaza and it's getting in Gaza. It snapped me back to reality of like, what are my priorities in life? Like, am I prioritizing my salah? Am I prioritizing like the things that I need to like this life truly is temporary and there are things that we're getting from this like I think we're learning more from the people in Gaza and in Palestine than they're getting from us. We're learning so much and the world is like converting to Islam. It's literally strengthening people's deen and so many people are looking into it because of that what you said which is saying Alhamdulillah when things are happening to them and subhanAllah this might be a part of the plan a part of the plan of people bringing people to islam and really like spreading that that faith you know and strengthening us as people yeah subhanallah um that's something that i think when you're not muslim and you see how they've been dealing with this it it doesn't surprise me to see so many people getting interested in islam and converting because for us it's like yeah of course islam is the religion that we (laughs) need to follow but for them that wasn't the case you know for so many years they they knew that islam existed and they knew that you know um like people were converting to it but they were just like yeah i mean that's their personal journey and it was more so i feel like they were lacking something in their life and they needed to find an answer and they find this answer in Islam. Whereas the people that got interested in Islam after what is, seeing what is going on in Palestine, and I might be mistaken, I don't know, but the way I see it is that they were just like, what, like, what is the magic behind this religion? Like, this is what is allowing them to cope with so much atrocities. And I think it just shows the power our deen has. And for me, it made me even prouder to be Muslim. And it really encouraged me to work even harder to be a better Muslim, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah, the way it gives us strength. Um, One thing that I wanted to uh, ask you about is that you mentioned how, you know, people have different coping mechanisms so some people are going to 
you know, they're going to have a hard time sleeping. They're going to have a hard time eating, things like this. Um, how do we inspire people to let go of that guilt? Because one thing that I, that I got a lot was um, I received so many messages of people saying either, is it normal that I don't feel anything anymore when I'm exposed to things that are not normal to see online when I go on social media and I see like so much blood and so much dead bodies is it normal that I am not feeling anything anymore and that's one thing and people feeling guilty about basically either taking a step back setting some distance and then there's the other end of the spectrum with people as we mentioned that uh, have been physically ill because of everything that is happening and they're like is it normal for me to feel this way and not live my life because I feel I feel so guilty about living mine when they are not able to do so so like what can we do to help them just let go of that guilt in both situations um so when I hear letting go of guilt it's just really thinking about what is it we're trying to let go of um because I think all emotions you know, are given to us by Allah for a reason and for us to feel them. So or do we want to let them go or do we want to learn how to regulate them, regulate them in a way that is functional, right? Because we need to feel guilt sometimes because if we don't feel guilt, then are we going to be proactive in things in life, right? Especially when it comes to social justice issues. Um, so thinking about guilt is like, what does guilt serve as? And, um, and especially in the situation, right? Because we do need to feel guilt sometimes. We need to feel guilt because that's what helps us become more proactive and also differentiating is it guilt or is it humanity right because you see people who are looking at these things and they don't care they don't care how many people are dying they're making fun of it right except for us we're feeling survivor's guilt and we're feeling feelings we're feeling compassion we're feeling helpless we need to have these feelings to remember we're human but how do we not let it cripple us i think that's the question not letting go of the feeling but how do we regulate it in a way that helps us keep going in a social justice path how do we help our communities right? Not letting it go because we need it. Um, and then also thinking about how are you functioning with this feeling, right? Just like grief. How do we function with grief? We're always going to be grieving our people, right? You're always going to feel sad in what's happening to them and their suffering. We need to grieve for them because that keeps us proactive. Um, but we don't want to get rid of our grief. But how do we function with it where we're not you know, you're not isolating, you're not keeping to yourself, you're not, you know, cutting off all social media because you want nothing to do with it, because that's also not the Muslim thing to do, right? Um, can we take breaks from it? Yes. Can we, um, you know, recognize that maybe we're not, we're too depressed and too anxious to be looking at certain things? Yes, please take a break. You need to be functional. We have to think, what do I need right now to function better? Not get rid of all these feelings, um, but how do I regulate them? It's kind of like swimming with them in a way that you can actually get to the shore versus drowning in them. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. And it, I'm so glad that you mentioned this because I remember at, at first, um, I was sharing a lot of Palestine content on my personal account because it's mostly followed by non-Muslim. And I just thought Muslims are already really exposed to this. So I might just try to focus on educating people that are not. And it, at first, I was so angry that people were that people were not sharing. You know, I was like, "Why is no one of my friends not sharing and and not interacting and not engaging with that kind of co of content?" And then I started receiving messages from my non-Muslim friends and people that follow me that used to go to university with me, and they were like, "Thank you so much for what you've been doing," because. I am not exposed to what is going on. And although I am I don't feel comfortable diving into it because I get a lot of anxiety from seeing that type of scene of everything, I have been talking about it to my family and friends around me. And that got me thinking. I was like, you know, it's not because you don't you don't feel like being spending too much time on social media and sharing content that can be pretty graphic that if you it's not because you don't do that that you're not helping Palestinians one way or another and then subhanallah i was on instagram and i saw a post about this topic specifically saying that 
there are so many ways you can help Palestinians. And it doesn't have to only be going on social media, consuming graphic content, because we are not made to be exposed to so many things. And when I see people saying, is it normal that I feel like my heart is dead and I don't, it's just, I don't react to this type of content anymore. I'm like, you don't have to blame yourself for this because you did not ask for this. And, you know, you mentioned something that was very true is that certain people, they don't care at all. Like they just don't, they don't care at all. And there's a difference between not caring and like caring, but trying to protect yourself. And I think when you are like, I, I just don't want to see this anymore you are trying to preserve your humanity and i think sometimes this is what you need to help the cause the best way possible so that was something that with my own account i decided to do like i knew from the beginning of all of this that i did not want to expose my audience to violence and graphic content because that is something that i avoid for myself any time that i've seen kids in blood or parents holding their dead but their dead kids body i was like this is not something that i can see it's just not something that allows me to be the best ally to the cause that uh, that i can be but even if we set that aside i feel like that was really impacting my mental health and when your mental health is impacted i do think that your iman also gets impacted and that's not something that we want you know, sometimes you're on, online and you see Palestinians themselves getting so mad because they're they're desperate, you know? And we have to think that if you end up sharing this kind of content, it's because you are desperate and you just need the world to hear you. And some of them, they might sound angry and like, you are ignoring our messages. You are not sharing and interacting with 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 the content that we're sharing to speak our voices. But I think we should not take this personally, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they are speaking out of anger a lot of the time when they're addressing people like this. And we cannot blame them because the situation is is a lot to handle. But that doesn't mean that we need to take this personally and force ourselves into something that ultimately might make us sick, both from a mental and physical health point of view. Right. Right. And and they're not saying, I want you to share images of all of our dead bodies, of my loved one looking like this versus how they looked when they were alive and doing well. It doesn't mean that. It means hear us. It means help. Right. And exactly what you said is there's so many different forms of like, quote unquote, activism. There's so many different ways to do something that it doesn't necessarily always have to be posting on social media there's a benefit to it 100 and there are people that are really good at it and that are spreading a lot of things and we reshare those things to help and we also a lot of us have other expertise in other fields that can be really really helpful at the moment too um and you know what it it actually what you're talking about kind of reminds me of um a conversation that i had in, in my sort of journey when it comes to social media as well um someone who's not Arab, not Palestinian, not Muslim, like just kind of like not in the world that I feel like we're in where we're constantly being like seeing all these images. I remember telling them very clearly, these images, in all honesty, they're not for me. I've seen them growing up since I've been really young. Like I see it on Al Jazeera on my TV, like I'm Palestinian, I hear it from my family members. They're not these images are not exactly for me. They're for other people that don't know what's going on and that don't talk about it. They're for other people to wake them up. What I need is information. I want to keep be updated. I want to know how I can help. I want to know all these other things. But these really graphic images have a purpose and a place, yeah. right? And it's, it's I, I believe it's mainly that. It's for the people that really need to see it and have it in their face to show yeah. them, like, this is what's actually happening and you're ignoring it, Right. Whereas a lot of us, like, we've seen it over and over and over again. And, like, we get it. (laughs) We know. And the information and images here and there are enough for us to know that this is not okay what's going on. That it is a genocide. And that there are things that we need to do. And almost preserving ourselves to be able to provide more, right? So your individual choice of not wanting to post it 
is so that way you can continue doing what you're doing. While other people, their followers might be followers that need to see those images and their decision to post it is for that reason. And the balance here is to make sure that we're not desensitizing the world to images of Palestinian bodies like that, right? So there is a benefit and a balance of the way that we do it. So I, I fully agree with a lot of the things that you're mentioning. Yeah, this is something that I I talked about with um, one of my friends and 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 she was saying that same thing that she felt that she was getting used to that type of content when she she knew how like it's been going on for a long time and this isn't the first time that Palestinians are going through things that are this hard so she know she knew but she felt like this time that there has been a shift in the way that the Palestinian cause is, is being like talked about especially on social media and i i think we can it's fair to say that a lot of people we're not talking about governments like actual people like citizens are standing with palestine most people around the world we see we saw this through protests we saw it through social media the use of hashtags the, the amount of content that is being put out there we see that the word is seeing the truth you know people know that this isn't normal and that this is a genocide and that they might want to cover the truth as much as they want they are the the terrorists if we have to speak truly like it, it's been there's been this whole narrative about you know terrorism being associated to islam you know and when it's a non-muslim and it's not to say that Judaism is about terrorism because Zionism is not Judaism, you know. We see so many Jewish people being against what is going on and so many also Israelis that are not, like, who not agree with what is being done to Palestinians. But there's been, like, this thing for going on for such a long time of people thinking that terrorism is associated to Arabs and Muslims, you know. I see it here in France when it's a Muslim person doing an attack, it's a terrorist, but when it's a white man, it's just a sick person, you know, that needs to see a psychiatrist. Um, I feel like the narrative when it comes to what is going on between Palestine and Israel is changing. And now people are realizing that it th there is an actual problem. And this we have to be grateful for because this hasn't always been the case. So it's good to see that as a community, we've been able to change that. But as you said, again, I think it's so important to know that there are so many ways that you can help and that you don't need to beat yourself up or to stop living your life. That like everything happens to a reason at the end of the day. And if Allah chose that Palestinians were going to get through this and that you were going to live your life in the US, France, the UK, where, wherever you are in the world, then it's just it means that it was meant to happen that way, but that you still have a mission and you can still help to the best of your abilities. And if we need to be objective, we don't, we're not equal in terms of mental health when it comes to dealing with all of this, because I feel like your own traumas can act up. What you, if you are Palestinian yourself and are part of the diaspora, then it also you're not going to deal with the situation the same way as a non-Palestinian is going to to do so. So there's so many factors that we need to keep in mind, and I think you know we always say that Allah is the most merciful, but He also wants us to be merciful to ourselves and to others. There are so many ways that you can help the cause, but. If you want to do so, you also need to preserve yourself and see how you are dealing with the situation on a personal level and how this collective trauma has been impacting you so you can hopefully help the cause the best way possible. It's it's such an important... I think there's like so much um, talk about social media, right? And like being able to do all of those things. And it is important. And there's probably... You're probably valid in being mad at some people for not posting like maybe they're they really should have right um but it's such a good reminder that there are like so many different ways to be able to do it um and then you know Harima, do you have anything that you were thinking of 
Yeah, as I was listening to Asia and you're talking about social media and what our capabilities are and all that, you know, I think this big this is a big issue with Muslims is we strive for perfectionism. And like um and one of the things I see is like people feeling helpless because they're not in Gaza. And the thing is, is like what happens, you're so focused, like the only way I can help is if I was in Gaza and because I can't be in Gaza, then I'm helpless and then it cripples you versus going back. Okay, what can I control? What do I have access to? Right. Like all the things that people have been able to do, like such as boycotting, spreading awareness, um, spreading even the message of Islam within the message of, you know, what's going on in Palestine. Right. Because this is what's going on is a. A Muslim issue, right? What's going on and, and it's impacting Muslims. So just thinking about, am I feeling helpless because I'm not in Gaza? And how is me because I'm not in Gaza doing something, right? Which is not realistic for me right now, preventing me from actually doing anything at all. So it's kind of like the black and white thinking, right? So how do we go in the gray when we know we can't do this, but what can we do? And allowing that to just be enough for now. And I, I want to emphasize enough for now. Because the more you do, you might have be able to have access to do more, right? If we can just allow us to do what we're capable of at this moment, it does open more doors, right? Especially in the social justice aspect, right? Like, okay, if I do this, then it'll open another door and it opens another door. There's always a door to open in regards to justice. There's never a closed door. I think as long as you believe there isn't a closed door for you in regards to contributing to justice, we as an OMA can really, really make change. That is so well said. And while you were talking, um, Halima, I thought about something that... Uh, wasn't in the questions that I planned, but I'm curious to know if that is something that you had to face during, like when you talk to clients. Um, I remember I talked, I made a video on my French TikTok about Palestine and and how it, it is a Muslim issue. Uh, I got a, flu, a few Muslim people saying, um, you guys are talking about Palestine because you're you're somewhat related to Arabs, like, like you are either from North Africa or whatever. Um, that's like, that's why you connect to it so much. But you don't talk about like people in Sudan or in other countries like Uyghurs and everything. You don't talk about them as much and they're going through horrible things as well. Why are you making that difference between Palestine and all the other Muslims suffering around the world? Is that something you've heard Um, and what has been your response to that? Because that is something that I I always take it as a yes, that is true. We have to be honest. Like the the cover the media coverage is not the same when it comes to Palestine and other causes that and other people that are suffering around the world. But the, like, if we had to pinpoint a difference, is that Palestine is a holy land. It it just as we said at the beginning it has like a very strong connection to islam that just it makes it impossible for us as muslims to not feel involved in what is going on but i don't know what do you guys think i first of all i wouldn't invalidate um anything when someone's saying like why are we not focusing on the other countries and what's happening in sudan somalia and all the other countries because genocide has been happening in countries forever like this isn't new right Um, I think it's the way yeah. it's the access to it and, and also watching genocide live, right? Because I think certain countries don't have that media access. Yeah. So I would say that, and I wouldn't invalidate that there is, there is going something that there is kind of an uneven, um, coverage. Okay. We can't say there isn't, there is, there's definitely an uneven coverage. Palestine in a lot of ways, um, you know, I always so used to say like, I feel like Palestine gets coverage, but in a way that has caused it more harm, Right. I think this is one of the first times I've ever seen Palestine get coverage in a way that's actually given us something, right? It's spreading in a way that it's actually causing change. Yeah. Um, so there's one thing, right? It's like kind of looking at that. Well, why was Palestine given more coverage even back? And it has actually contributed to the stereotype of Muslims being terrorists. So I want to I want to recognize also that part is why in ways that uh, coverage to certain Muslim countries has caused actually adding on to the stereotype. And then there's coverage that we've as Muslims challenged. Like we know this is not what's going on, right? Because of what's happening. Like there's more, like more truth coming out. Um, and that, you know, we do, I think, um, tend to focus on Palestine a lot. And there is a cultural aspect to that, right? I think, um, I think we, this is layers and layers, right? And I don't yeah. Know. And I think, uh, Hanima, what you're getting at, like there is a bit of harm, I think sometimes in the way that it is um, being 
you know, noticed. And one big thing that I can think of is because it's been something that's been going on for a lot of our like lives, we were born and the occupation was happening. There is this almost like trend of being pro-Palestinian, like wearing kufiyas and not fully understanding what it is. And like, there is a lot of that that also sort of comes out of it. Um, and so not to like complain that <laughs> Palestine is getting like attention and media coverage, but it's, there really is like, so much to say on both sides that there is a bit of like harm that can come from the way that it's being covered and at the same time it's true why are we not covering the other things like we were approached by um a few people asking us to do a sudanese healing circle and we're like thank you so much for bringing this to our attention like this is happening and we do have the skill to do that so we would love to do that for you like let us please you know do that and so you know, we were able to do something like that, learn a little bit more from the folks that were there, teach people that are Sudanese therapists, like how to run Sudanese healing circles. Um, and then, you know, really like actually like delve, you know, into that valid point. It is valid. Like, let us please do what we can in the other way as well. Yeah, this so. is something that I, I told you, I, I, when I got exposed to this, I was like, yeah, you, you're right. That is, that is true. And even what you said about you know, part of being part of it sometimes being cultural and doing like being pro Palestine because that's just the way it is as a Muslim or an Arab is something that I experience myself with people that well, <laughs> those people they're not necessarily a, a great example of reference because they are pro Israel. But one thing that I got was you're only supporting Palestine because you're Muslim. And I thought that that is not a fair thing to say, because although there are some people who might be in that situation, I think the way that I I personally educated myself on the history of Palestine and the culture of Palestine and everything and what I am sharing to hopefully educate other people about things that we don't see in mainstream media shows that it goes beyond my religion or my ethnicity. But it is true that there is so many things to disconstruct for us to, again, be like the best support to the cause as possible. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that I am so glad that you've been doing healing circles for other groups of people. Because, you know, I remember at the beginning of my account, I did I did a post about what is going on in China with Muslim Uyghurs and everything. And so many people didn't know about it. but then. My account was smaller, but I remember it didn't get as much traction as my other posts. And that was very frustrating to me. And same goes with, you know, we're talking about social justice. I feel like environmental justice is also an issue. And it's not just about, you know, protecting the planet and global warming. Like certain people around the world are suffering from this way more than others. And same, it doesn't get the same attention because it's just not something people either understand or deeply connect to. And so obviously, when you take all those things into consideration, you see that Palestine does have like a different treatment when it comes to it. But again, as as you justly said, it's we see that it's different now, like the way like if I think about all the years that I've been on social media, this is the first time that I see so many people talking about Palestine that are not Muslim or not Arab. And that for me has been like a small victory. You know, I was like, Alhamdulillah, this is finally happening. People are finally opening their eyes. And so I think that although it's so important to not invalidate the feelings of those who are like, why are you not talking about my people as much? I think it's so important as well to be like, hey, it's supposed to give us hope. Like if this happened to Palestine after 75 years of occupation, then this might be the start for us as well to get consideration and people like getting interested in what is going on. I think the like a lot of people now are realizing that the Western world has not always had the greatest impact on the world. And so people are now getting interested in what is going on in Africa, what is going on going on in the Middle East, and the positive things that we're getting out of this. And I think, you know, it's so important to to open that conversation and be like, I understand how you feel, this is true, but let's be positive, like turn this 
this frustration into something that hopefully can be beneficial to most people, inshallah. And you're right, there's a shift. I mean, there's, I truly think there was a desensitization of talking about Palestine. It's like, oh, it's happening again. Oh, it's Ramadan and they're being bombed again. Oh, this is right. Whereas yeah. this time it feels like it was, un- and unfortunately, it was so bad that you can't ignore it anymore. And so many different movements and i've seen this at protests i've seen this in my own like organizing spaces so many movements we connect to Palestine. so we'll say there is no liberation in this world without the liberation of palestinians and that opens the door to the liberation of other people if we can notice palestinians and we can notice what's been so gaslit and hidden and propaganda if we can notice that then we can open the doors as well to all these other like wildly things that are like happening in the world um and I, that connection i think is such a strength in our community because and i and i hear this from people in healing circles from clients it's like why does it feel like the world doesn't see us and these are palestinian people speaking these are other muslims that are speaking of like why does it yeah. feel like like that and really actually realistically when you're looking at it the majority of the world like realizes that palestine is suffering that there is a genocide happening the people in power are the ones that are rooting for it. They're the ones that are taking actions and making decisions and and propaganda on so on media and in the news and all of that to almost make it feel like there are not people that are watching. And so when we connect our struggles to each other like that yeah, with exactly. other people's struggles, like the Muslim Uyghurs, like with what's going on in Sudan, with Somalia, when we connect all of those things our voices are louder, right? Like we have to remember that. We have to remember that when we connect our struggles like that, we make a bigger impact. Um, can I add can I add something actually on that? Because I do want to acknowledge, I do want to acknowledge though that there there is within the Muslim community, right? There are racial dynamics. And I think this can also be connected to kind of a hierarchy on, you know, Arabs versus other people in ever, other backgrounds, right? So I, I don't want to ignore that part either because I think that can still play in with everything else we mentioned, right? Is like we have ignored countries and as Muslims, we need to take responsibility and accountability for only focusing. Because when I said culture, I meant I think people think it's cool sometimes to wear a kofiya and be pro-Palestinian, right? Versus it's not as cool maybe for another country that's going through genocide. And we also need to hold ourselves accountable as Muslims because Allah is going to ask us about that. And we can't say, oh, well, because it was a holy site. It can't just because of a holy site. So we really need to admit that, okay? We need to be real with that part too. I love that you mentioned this because one thing that has always really annoyed me is that... um, I would look at Arab people, um, people from, you know, North Africa, and it always felt like they thought they owned Islam, like they had that superiority and that they were the one that incarnated Islam the best because they're Arab, they're like the same ethnicity as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they speak the language of the Qur'an. And what that has always been very frustrating to me because I've never felt like they were the people that knew religion best, <laughs> to be completely honest. But what really opened my eyes is when I traveled to Indonesia, which is the biggest Muslim country in the world. And the way I obviously no one is perfect and there are people that practice really well in every region of the world and there are people that need to improve in every region of the world but the way Islam was practiced there made me made really open my eyes and I was like people need to stop thinking that Islam is is owned by Arabs and I think there's like this thing that is playing out because a lot of people are going to be like oh yeah, I, I like Palestine is part of the Middle East and it's everything is connected. But it's, again, it's not fair to think this way because Allah did not make Islam just for Arabs. He made Islam for everyone. And when, you know, when you go to, when you see Mecca, for example, when whether you look at people doing Umrah or people doing Hajj, it's just beautiful to see all the diversity that coexists in that one that one space and doing the same thing and that we are all going to be judged the same way when all of this is over but a lot of people forget about that and 
I I do love that we mention it in this episode that it's so important to realize that we have also to question ourselves sometimes and our responsibility. It doesn't mean that we are bad people or anything, but you know, I always say this on the account, but Islam is also about it's it's about growing and it's about improving yourself and you cannot do that if you think that you are doing enough you know you need to and it it does imply things like this as well it's not just oh i need to improve on my salah or i need to you know like fast more often it also means how do i like what is my relationship with the ummah how am i helping my brothers and sisters because if we are called this way that is for a reason and when you say brother and sister it's not just people that look like you it's also people it, it's people that believe in Allah and his mens- in and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam so i think it's so important to have that in mind and i'm so so glad that that we got to to mention it alhamdulillah i just think it's so so important and Halima, i appreciate you bringing it back up reminding us that there is racism there is colorism there is those things and and that's what people are reacting to right like why are we in the men- the countries that we mentioned are countries that are non-Arab. Like, why are we not focusing on some of those things as well? So I appreciate you both for bringing that up and reminding us. But hopefully, inshallah, as I said, I really hope that can be the start of people getting into it and at least educating themselves on what is going on in other countries. Um, I, I truly believe in the power of, of knowledge and education. And I think the moment we start doing that, that it's just, as we said earlier, it doesn't mean that just because you don't share it online that you cannot you know make a change and i think it's just um it's really important to have this in mind so to wrap up the episode i wanted to ask you guys how we can really come together as a community to support anyone dealing with trauma collective trauma and especially considering what is going on in gaza well i guess we did mention a few things i think throughout you know, the podcast thing as we were talking, right, is noticing all these things is, first of all, you do want to know what's going on in your body and you want to know what's going on with your emotions. You know, obviously seek help, right? Um, You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And either it's a support group, a healing circle, a mentor, um, the masjid, you know, all these, all the, all our communities are in connection with us that, you know, doesn't just have to be therapy. There's other ways to seek help. And also thinking about like the reminder of like, are you are you feeling help, so helpless that you're not doing anything because you're not in Gaza? And I think that's a big one. Is like, what can you do now? And focus on that and allowing that to be enough. And I know we went through all these things in the past hour of ways you can think about. And I hope that everything that we have said so far has has you know helped reframe the way you're seeing things, right? The way you see helplessness, the way you see guilt, right? And also not confusing guilt with your your humanity, and also say Alhamdulillah that you feel humanity. Because we see how people who don't have it are living their lives and, and you know, and, and it is a blessing. But how can we let our humanity be a blessing and not, not a curse to us because we're sad, right? And again, it's just regulating that. Um, so, yeah, I, w- I just want to share that. And Amira, feel free to add anything else. Yeah, to- and I'll touch on the other end, I think, of what people might feel, which is numbness, right? Like feeling really numb to, like, you're like, I, I don't feel anything anymore and it is a trauma response it is a response to being bombarded with an overwhelming amount of feelings and I want you to reframe like Halima was saying numbness as you are truly experiencing an overwhelming amount of emotions therefore your body is protecting itself and reacting in a way of numbness it's like shutting down in that way and what you really need to do is recognize that there are intense feelings underneath it and we think about it as like a pressure gauge right you let it build up, build up, build up. It's going to come out in a different way that you did not expect. It's going to explode out. So you really need to let it out slowly. And in Hanima and I do this work with a lot of our clients and a lot of us people of color experience somatic stuff, right? So then you're feeling numb, but you're not sleeping, but you can't eat, but your stomach hurts, right? And so when you start to feel any tinge of emotion, I encourage you to sit with it for a little bit. Don't stuff it down and put it back in a box and put it to the side like we all are really good at doing. Feel it for a little bit, right? Let yourself feel it so that way you can process and sort of like almost get it out of your system rather than letting it build up and allow you to feel numb. And so I want you to reframe numbness into 
you are feeling emotions. They're there. You're really good at pushing them down and putting them in a box so that way you can continue on. And every once in a while, you need to take out that box, untangle it a little bit, and then you can put it back so you can kind of continue on with your day. Um, so I, I, I wanted to touch on like the other piece of what people might be feeling at the moment. Thank you so much for this pieces of advice. Um, I want to add that when you hear this and how important it is to be connected to your emotions and embrace them instead of you know ignoring them or hiding them or whatever um it is completely connected to islam like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to just ignore that he wants you to feel i i think there's a lot of misconception around the verse that says don't lose don't lose hope nor be sad so a lot of people will will use that verse to say you shouldn't cry you shouldn't feel sad you shouldn't you know feel desperate but that's not what it means it means that allah is bringing you reassurance he's like you are going to feel this way you are going to feel this way but you need to trust me with everything you need to uh, like embrace those emotions as you said sit with them for a little bit and then do the work work on this go talk to someone if you feel like you need it participate in a healing circle And also, one thing that we didn't mention, but that is so important, is that don't underestimate the power of dua. Like, <laughs> I, I cannot stress that enough. But, you know, when we say talk to someone, it, it it's important to talk to people, but also talk to Allah. Like, he, he knows, he sees everything. He knows what you're going to say before you say them to, to him. He knows what is going on in Palestine in ways that we we cannot even fathom because he is the all-knowing he's the all-seeing so talk to him and trust him when he says that he is with us you know um this is so important and i truly hope that this episode and the podcast in general just allows you to accept that we are humans we are going to go through a lot of emotions and we're all different as well you know comparison can be healthy in certain ways but when it comes to this specific thing i don't think you should you know compare yourself to other people and the way they're dealing with this because first of all you don't know what how they're actually dealing with it and also in those moments it's just so important to reconnect with how you feel and you deserve to to take that time for yourself so I I cannot be grateful enough for both of you to accepting to do this episode with me. Um, I would love to to do other episodes with both of you because the first episode I wanted to do were about eating disorders and depression. And um, maybe we can do that in the next season of the podcast, inshallah. But I'm so glad that you accepted to change the topic and talk about this um like have this conversation together because I truly feel like it's important. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. And giving us the opportunity to share some of the things that we're seeing with like all these other people and hoping that you benefit from it, inshallah. inshallah. And we would love to work with you again. Uh, thank you so much. I, honestly, it's um, I, I do really feel like there's so much work that needs to be done when it comes to the mental health space as Muslims. Um just an anecdote to wrap up the episode but one of the friend that i keep mentioning who is a psychologist she did this conference about uh maryam radiallahu anha and she was saying in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there was a point when she would have preferred to be dead you know she meant she mentions thoughts that anyone in the muslim community these days would be like How can you feel this way? Like suicide is haram. Like you, you are lacking faith. But we're talking about one of the best women in Islamic history. We're talking about the mother of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. And when you think about this, it's crazy. And my friend was saying, if Allah decided to have this verse in the Quran, that's for a good reason. He, it's the Quran. He had the choice of what he was going to put in it but if he gave you that lesson it's to show you that even the best people the best human beings of islamic history had those really dark thoughts so you shouldn't like 
beat yourself up and be too hard on yourself for feeling the same way. You know, you're only human. Once again, Allah knows what you're going through. He knows that when we are going to see what is going on in Palestine, it's going to really take a toll on us. It, it's it's only fair. But you really need to just be kind with yourself and find comfort in the fact that Allah knows and that he will make us victorious. He promised to us that believers were going to be victorious. And alhamdulillah, if you're listening to this podcast, hopefully you are a believer. Palestinians are believers as well. So hopefully, inshallah, we can all meet in Jannah. And yeah, and thank you so much, Amira and Halima, for joining me for this chat. Thank you for having us, Asya. It's It's been such a pleasure to have you both. Thank you so much to everyone who listened to this, this episode. If you have any questions, you can, hopefully they can send you a, um, an email, I guess. How can they reach out to you? Absolutely. So uh, our website is very easy. It's amali.org, A-M-A-L-Y.org. We have a lot of information on there. You can sign up for support groups, for therapy, for couples, um, for all of those things. And then you can also email us directly at info at emily.org, um, info at emily.org. And we basically, we res- both of us have access to it as well as our administrative assistant will respond as quickly as we can. And sometimes it's random questions like, you know, where can I access resources in my random state that I'm in that's not <laughs> California where we can provide, you know, therapy. So we're very open to um, doing consults and answering your questions inshallah, inshallah that, that's amazing I will put everything in the podcast or the, the episode description so it's easy to find for everyone but yeah thank you again so so much to both of you thank you to all of you who listened to this episode and I uh, will see you in the next one not see you I always say see you like like I don't know how to say it because we don't see each other but you got the idea <laughs> <laughs> Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bye. <laughs>